This is a GMBN Tech Essential Series, our easy to follow guide to setting up, maintaining and understanding your bike. In this video, we're looking at the cockpit setup on a bike, and we're gonna be giving you some tips on getting some nice smooth cable routing, avoiding things like paint being taken off your frame, and of course, getting those vitals all set up correctly. Now on the cockpit of a mountain bike, there can be a lot of things going on. You can have multiple cables and hoses for your brakes, your shifters, dropper posts, any cable actuated lockouts you might have. And then of course there's other things going on. You have to cram all this in, there's gonna be the different position of the things on the bars. You might have some light brackets on there, you might have a computer mount on the bars, and things can get a bit messy. So it's really important to get things all in order so they're working to the best for you. Now first up, let's take a look at your overall position. Now depending on your height, your riding style, and of course the fit of your particular bike, you can have your cockpit set up in various different ways. Now the current trend is to go for shorter stems and wider bars. The reason for that is the wider bar gives you a bit more stability and a bit more control, whereas that shorter stem keeps things nice and agile. If you're to have a longer stem, your handling can feel quite vague and you can have a lot of weight bias to the front of the bike, which can feel quite unnerving at times when riding steep and technical terrain. Likewise, if you're gonna have a narrower bar, it can put you in quite an upright position and it can mean you have not as much leverage over the control of the bike, so it can feel quite nervous. But there is a limit to this. Now, if we look at the bar width first, this is quite an important one. Now, bear in mind, I'm about six foot three and I'm running a full width bar. So the full width on a standard handlebar is about 800 millimeters. Now, there is no right and no wrong for the way you would run your handlebars on your bike. But really, if you're a nice tall rider, a wider bar makes more sense, just like the fact that if you're a shorter rider, a narrower bar does. Now, I'm talking anything from about 720 millimeters up to 800 mil. But what you don't want to be is a short rider having these big wide bars that can actually hinder the way you ride a bike. It's all about getting things into perspective for your body fit. Now with regards to stem length, this one is actually really important. Now it's dictated by the length of your bike. The modern craze is to go for the shortest stem possible to give your bike that real agile, aggressive feeling. But you can't just put a short stem on any bike. On my other bike, for example, which is a longer bike than this, I have a tiny, 35 millimeter stem. But on this bike, which is a bit shorter, I need to keep my cockpit in the correct position for my height and obviously my position on the bike. And that means using a 60 millimeter stem here. So it's not the same for every rider, but it's really important to find something that offers you the correct amount of control, but it's not too cramped at the same time. Now the length stem that's supplied on your bike, if you're buying a bike new, is a good indication of where you need to be. Now, just for example, if your bike, assuming you have a new bike, comes with a 70 millimeter stem, that's a good indication of the correct size stem for your height, depending on which size bike you went for. But you could still go for a slightly shorter stem if you wanted your bike to feel a bit more aggressive, but you wouldn't want to go shorter than a 50 millimeters. I would suggest that going from a 70 to a 50, it's probably about as far as you'd want to go without ruining the handling of your bike. As your handlebars come closer to you, you're gonna be more upright on the bike, which means you're gonna have less weight on the front wheel. Now, whilst this will feel really good when you're descending, it creates problems with other styles of riding. When you're climbing and out the saddle, it means your handlebars are closer to your knees, which means you might strike your knees on the bars. And this is something we're gonna look at with setup shortly. Likewise, when you're climbing, you're not gonna have enough weight on that front wheel, so you might find you have to compensate quite a lot in order to keep the bike balanced and prevent it from wheeling up a hill. It's all about finding the correct fit for you. Don't be too swayed by fashions insisting that you go for a shortest stem possible and a nice wide bar, because it doesn't always work that way. Another thing to take into account is the height that you run everything at. A nice low front end can give you a nice riding position, a nice efficient position, especially for climbing, but it will also mean that you'll sacrifice a little bit of control on the steeper descending stuff and it can make you feel a bit pitched over the front end of the bike. But you have to have the happy medium that enables you to feel comfortable when seated, comfortable when stood, comfortable when climbing and comfortable when descending. 
You can't make a bike, unless it's a particular bike like a downhill bike, excel in any one situation. It needs to work in a number of situations. So again, don't be too influenced by the fashion there. And the final point with your cockpit control setup is you actually rise of your handlebars. Now you might note here I've got nearly a flat handlebar on this bike. That's because the front end of this bike has 29 inch wheels and it's quite high. So I need to return my weight down again to keep an even weight distribution between the front and rear wheels. On my other bike, which is also a 29 inch wheel bike, it's exceptionally long. If I was to have the same low position on that, I'd find it incredibly hard to lift the front wheel of the bike. So on that bike, I have a shorter stem and a higher bar to compensate for the length. On this bike, an 800 millimeter bar and a 60 mil stem with just a single spacer underneath there is perfect for me. Now this is something that you should experiment with because even just a little bit of rise underneath that stem makes a huge difference to how your bike feels. Don't just ride as it is, have a little play. You can actually make things feel better. Now once you've finalized the position you have your bars and stem at, it's time to look at the actual controls there. And what I mean by that are your shifters and your brake levers. So things like your dropper post remote, your gear shifter and your brake levers. Now the brake levers are the most important part of the cockpit because quite simply they are the thing that stop you having accidents. They're there for safety reasons, they're there to control your speed, they're there to stop you when you need to stop and they have to be in the correct position for you to use at any time. It needs to be second nature to just use your brakes and therefore it's really important to find what's going to work for you. Now the obvious position for a brake lever to be would be rested up against your handlebar grip which will be installed to the handlebars but this isn't always the correct place for this because you're going to have a different preference for the way you like to use the brake. Some riders like to use two fingers, some like to use three, some like to use a single finger. Now for example I've got this loose just so you can see the effects here. If I was to use a single finger with my brake lever in this position, the brake lever is going to hit my knuckles before it actually bites. Don't need me to tell you that that is not a good thing. If I'm using two fingers I can get away with it but I prefer to use a single finger on my brakes and have more of my hands holding onto the handlebars. Now this has to suit you. Don't be swayed by what I have on my bike or what your friends have. It has to work for you. It's a safety part of the bike. So therefore to make it work for me I will move my brake lever inboard on the bike until the brake lever is in a position where I can use it and it doesn't strike any of my other digits and enables me to use the brake effectively. Now something else to note by having my brake set up so I can use it with one finger it means I'm using the very end of the brake lever so I've got a good mechanical advantage there. I've got more leverage on that brake lever which means my finger has to do less work to achieve more power. So next up, there are two other factors you need to take into account. One will be how close the brake lever blade is to the handlebars. If you have big hands, you're gonna want it further away. Likewise, if you have smaller hands, you're gonna need it closer. There's no right or wrong to the way you like it, but some riders like to have the brake lever rest in sort of the knuckle of their finger here before it actually actuates. This puts your hand in a powerful position for closing your knuckle and basically stopping the bike. If you're using the very end of your finger on the brake lever, it's gonna be more of a strain for your finger. But again, this is down to preference. It's not just down to how easy it is for your hands because you will adapt to this naturally. You just have to find what is more comfortable for yourself. Personally, I like my brake levers quite far out and quite far in away from the bars. The next factor is the angle of your brake levers. Now this is equally as important. Now you'll see in some videos, some people like their brake levers really far down and others like them really far up. Now again, there's no right or wrong, but they have different purposes. Now, someone who likes their brake levers down, this will suit someone who likes to ride out the saddle a lot and sprints a lot because it's gonna be easier for your arms to line up with those brake levers and it will naturally suit the way that rider wants to ride. Someone like Blake, for example, who's really into jumping, he likes to run his brakes quite far down because they're out of the way, which means if he's taking his hands off the bars for a trick, when he goes to reach back on, he's not accidentally gonna grab the brake lever. He's got access to the part of the grip that he needs and the brake lever is out the way. This is a really good way of thinking 
but it's not always the right position for a rider wanting to grab the brakes whenever they want because obviously it's quite far out of the way. Now the general school of thought is to have your brake levers run in line with your arm when you're sat in the saddle with the saddle at full extended height. Now the theory behind this is they're comfortable to reach and easy to reach when you're both seated and pedaling and stood at the saddle in an attack position. It also means if you have to lean forwards all the way you can still get to them and likewise if you have to get off the back of the saddle on steep terrain you can still reach them. But then there are still riders that like to run the controls quite far up, nearly horizontal. And I actually like this position myself and I had this tip from Rob Warner and Martin Ashton from many years back. Now the theory about having your brake levers higher is the fact that when your brakes are low you're basically resting quite a lot of strain on your hand and you're also using your hand for braking, so for gravity focused riding. It can be quite strenuous on your hand and on your forearm and you can suffer from things known as forearm pump which tends to happen on really long extended rough descents. That's the sort of stuff that you're going to want to ride. Having your brake levers that bit higher really does make a difference because more of your body weight is taken on the heel of your hand than it is on your actual grip which means your hand is going to be stronger for just doing the braking. Admittedly, the angle can feel a bit unnatural at first, but running your brake levers higher does put you in a bit more of a stronger position on the bike. You tend to see a lot of downhill racers running their brakes quite high, and again, like I said, trials-based riders do as well. Now, once you find a position that you're comfortable with and it feels right, it's well worth making a little marker on your handlebars that correlate to something on the clamp itself. So you have a reference point if you ever need to move something, which you will with regular maintenance on the bike, so you can get it back to that same position without having to relearn where your ideal sweet spot is. This is also useful if you lend a bike to someone and they might, without telling you, move your controls around. It could be really infuriating. So something that a lot of the pros do is use Tipex or a Sharpie or any other sort of coloured sharpie for example, just to fill in some of the blank spots or make a little reference mark. Neil did a bike check on Angel Suarez's YT Chuez downhill bike and on this little void area inside the clamp here, he'd actually coloured it in with what looked like a red sharpie. So he knew when travelling he could get his bike out of the box, line this up, crank up the bolt and go and hit the track. And he knew everything would be in the correct position. Of course you could see that, but what I like to do is make a little reference point with a black sharpie on a black bar that just lines up with the clamp itself. It's so small that no one will even know it's there except me, and it means every time I can get my handlebar set up exactly right. Now next up is how securely you tighten your brake levers to the bars. Now usually it's either a 5mm Allen key or a Torx T25 key that you'll need to secure this. Now it's well recommended to have a torque key or a torque driver of some kind and torque this up to the recommended setting, but I'm well aware that it's a bit more of an advanced thing to have in your torque kit, not something that everyone will have straight away. So we'll just put that to the side for a moment and use your common sense. Now you don't want to be over tightening this because A, this is a clamp and it's going over a handlebar. So not only can you damage the handlebar, especially if you're lucky enough to have a carbon bar, what it can mean is if you have a crash and you strike your brake lever, you're more likely to damage the brake lever. What I like to do is tighten mine, but only tight enough so they don't really move too much. Like literally, I can move this, but what it does mean, if I have a crash, it can move out the way and it's far less likelihood of actually snapping the brake lever off the bars. Now something to pay particular attention to if you do have carbon bars, is make sure that if this does happen and anything moves, you don't score the bars because the scoring mark in a set of carbon handlebars can be the start of the end. If you're unsure about that, take it to your nearest bike shop or your nearest friend that's an expert and get them to have a look at it and see what they think. Now, once your brake levers are set and you finalize your position of them, then you can look at the position of your gear lever. Now, the gear lever could have its own clamp in order to move it in and out on the bars, or it could have a built-in clamp like the matchmaker system on this particular one. So SRAM has a matchmaker system and Shimano has the iSpec system. 
What this means is your gear lever mounts to the brake lever on the bar, so it's nice and neat with a single clamp, but it does mean you have to fine tune things to get them exactly right. Now, first up, you can actually mount the shifter slightly more inboard or outboard. There's two mounting bolts. Now, just like my brake levers, I like my gear shifter to be inboard slightly. That might not be the case for you. It does depend how much you like to move around on the bar. So that is something you can experiment with when out riding. But what's more important initially to get right is the actual angle that you have them at. Now, for example, if you're to have everything tucked up nice and neatly under the lever, of course it looks great. And it's nice to use when you're seated and you're changing gears. But as soon as you're out the saddle and you're sprinting and you're moving around on the bike, you've got to basically move your arm quite a lot to get there. It's not a good dynamic position for your controls to be in. And if you're having to loosen your grip and move to change gear, I don't need to spell out what can happen if you're somewhere rough on a trail. Losing your grip, that means you're gonna crash. So what you wanna do is have it slightly lower. In fact, the lower it can go, the better it is for more aggressive riding. However, there is a limit to this. If you had your lever at the maximum extension all the way here, this is great for that aggressive riding. However, if your bike is slightly on the shorter side or you like a shorter stem, meaning your bars are nearer you, or you like riding in baggy shorts, this can spell danger because it's possible when riding aggressive terrain out of the saddle and sprinting to catch shorts over those levers. So just take that into account because I've crashed like that in the past and it's pretty nasty. So just be sure that you know exactly where the best position is for you. And the exact same rules apply to your dropper post remote or if you have a lever here on the left hand side, the same thing. You need to make sure it's far enough in or outboard that it's in a suitable position for you to use. Personally for me, I like my dropper post remote slightly more inboard and slightly away. The reason for that is I know the types of occasion when I'm gonna use it is typically when I'm about to descend or hit something technical, and in which case my body weight shifts anyway. So I'm already ready to move. So I like to be able to accentuate that whole movement. You might prefer yours in a more obvious position. The point is it has to reflect the style of riding and it has to be in a position that suits you. The same rules apply, although not necessarily with this one, which is quite a small lever, but some levers, like the RockShox Reverb one, it's more like a shifter lever, you're gonna have the same thing. So if it's mounted all the way around in a more aggressive position, you could be prone to snagging it on baggy clothing. So just be mindful of that. Even if it is clothing that you perhaps just ride on a daily basis, as opposed to when you actually hit the trails. Now, the last thing to take into account with your controls, in particular, the controls on the underside of your handlebars, i.e. your dropper post or your left-hand shifter and the right-hand shifter, are that they cannot strike your top tube when the bars revolve round. Like, for example, if you put your bike in the back of a car without the front wheel on, or if you have a crash, it's likely your bars will spin around. If you've got any sort of bad frame clearance here, it can mean you're gonna scratch and gouge the frame. This is not good on any type of frame, but it's especially bad on a carbon frame. So make sure you have enough clearance here. If the bars need to rotate all the way around, they're not gonna foul on the actual controls. Now this particular bike actually has a stopper built into the top tube here. It's actually quite a nice design, but it does mean you're limited in how far you can turn the bars. This is both fantastic because it means it limits it, but it might not suit you as a rider if you prefer the option to turn your bars further. Now, when you've finalized the position of your brake levers and all of your controls, then you can look at things like the cable routing. Now, here in the UK, we run our front brakes predominantly on the right-hand side, like a motorbike, and our back brake is on the left. Now, whilst this doesn't affect things on a grand scheme of things, it does mean that our cable routing is never gonna be as neat as if you run your front brake on your left. The reason for that, if your back brake is on the right-hand side, like US style, your gear lever is also here, so you can actually twin those cables together and follow the routing cleanly into the bike. This isn't the case of us. We have a bit more of a mess of cables to sort out. Now, in my case, you can see I've got a really long dropper post. I've only just fitted this post to the bike here and I actually need to trim this down because this is so long that it can actually get in the way of a light being on the bar and of course it's just it's not don't need this amount of cable here 
I can trim this right back and keep things nice and neat. A few things to be mindful of when you're trimming cables down and you're getting the routing correct is how much the cables, when you're turning the bars to the right or to the left, can rub on your actual head tube because that means you're going to be taking paint off there. Might not think so in the first place, but it will happen over time, especially when you ride in mud and other conditions where it kind of provides a, an abrasive sort of sandiness that literally those cables are just bit by bit going to dull down your paint. So I can't recommend enough getting yourself some protective frame stickers. They're usually clear, but you can get coloured ones that are like uh, faux carbon fibre and stuff like that. So if you want them to blend into your bike, they can be there. And effectively, they just sit there and they take the abuse that the cable would dish out to otherwise directly to your paintwork. And if you want to go completely over the top and make it as neat as possible, this is really good if you run your back brake on the right hand side. You can get some heat shrink or you could just do it with cable tires or electrical tape and actually tie those cables together. It looks really neat because it looks like a single cable passing around the head tube of the bike. And of course, it's actually going to quieten down your bike as well. Might not seem like it, but cables, they do rattle around when you're tackling rough terrain. And you start removing little bits of noise like this off your bike, suddenly you can hear the terrain a bit more. You can hear what's going on, the wind in your face, the, the noise of mud under your tires. It's a lot nicer than hearing parts of your bike rattling. So there we go, I have my controls on my bike exactly how I want them. Got my bars at the length I like, I've got them in the position that I like. Got my controls mounted inboard, I've made little reference marker points there. So if I do need to move them for any reason, it's easy to get them back in my preferred position. I've also tightened them, but not too tight, so they will move in the event of a crash and hopefully that will reduce the chance of breaking the brake levers if I'm unlucky enough for that to happen. And I've also tidied up my cables. I've got a little cable tie around these two here just to stop them rattling around. And I've trimmed down my dropper post cable. In doing that, I've also needed to put an anti sort of scuff protection sticker on the front of the head tube here just to protect it against that cable roaming around too much. So hopefully everything is sorted on my front end now. Now, the last thing you might notice is I've got a computer mounted on my stem here on the bike. Now, whilst this is really good for me, it might not be the best position for you if you're going to use a computer. There are various different mounts. You can mount them on the handlebar. You can mount them on the front of the stem. There's lots of options. If you're going to mount on the stem itself like this one, you have to make sure your bike is long enough because you can strike these with your knee. And if you do that, it's going to fire off into the bushes and it will always be a bush that you will never find it again. So make sure if you have this sort of kit and you're going to mount it on a bike, you mount it in a position that suits your riding position. Just take all of that into account. Now, if you want to find out a bit more about how I set my riding position up with my bars and stem, how I do it on the trail, click down here. And for the rest of our Essentials series, click down there. There's loads of really helpful, intuitive videos for you to follow. As always, if you like GMBN Tech and you like this essential series of bike setup, give us a huge thumbs up and don't forget to share and subscribe.